What's up, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast. I'm Scott Bear, sitting next to Tori McElhaney. Nope, not next to. Next to. Across, across from. from Tori. Yeah, I mean, accuracy is our job. I, I mean, should be accurate. that would be a lie. Uh-huh. <laughs> you would be lying to our listeners. I'd have to issue a... Uh, <laughs> Retraction. Yep. Yeah. Correction on the bottom of A2. Uh-huh. That's what I would do. Uh, so Tori McElhaney is across from me, and I guess we'll say adjacent... There you go. ...to me is... Ashton Edmonds. Really Correct. give Correct. Re- really give them a layout of the room. Yeah, yeah. This is this is my office. There's essentially nothing in it because I'm not fashionable or you choose should, to decorate the office. I mean, I there are two of, pictures yeah, of Roddy White and Claude Humphrey. I have one of my Michael Vick. That's gonna go up. Michael soon. Vick. <laughs> right. Legend. Uh, yeah, the legend. Not Mike. Michael. And uh, speaking of Michael Vick, all I will say is the ultimate tease. Keep an eye out for the website. If you yeah. happen to be a Michael Vick fan, just just kind of bookmark it. Check back every day. I mean, I don't know. Maybe he's going to show up there at some yeah. point in the near future. Wow. It's anybody's guess. Yeah. Uh, but we are not here to talk about uh, the former Falcons great, uh, former number one pick, Michael Vick. We are here to talk about some the, other draft. Yes. Keys. Another uh, a, a set of, of draft picks, the 2021 draft class, Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith's first as uh, members of the Falcons. And you always hear it, right? It's almost cliche to this point. The big jump that is made between year one and year two. The rookies coming in have basically had like a three-month job interview it, it, during the pre-draft process. Then they get dropped in for rookie mini camp, and then they're off and running, and they don't stop working until January. Right. Uh, so there's a lot going on. All these guys that we're going to talk about have had a full off season to exhale, to relax a little bit and find ways to improve and get better on what they did last year. A lot of these guys that we're going to talk about, we're, we're going to kind of go down the list, I would say, and break down all these different guys. A lot of these guys played a lot, a lot last of year, yeah. last maybe year. more than they had planned. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you think about Jalen Mayfield. I don't think that was supposed to be a thing. Right. Arthur Smith has said that wasn't supposed to be a thing. Absolutely not. He, he talks a lot about long-term vision for some of these players, and I think that his long-term vision and the expectations for some of the guys that we're going to talk about have obviously changed. We're going to go through the whole list, and as we wrote it down, we're like, man, that's a lot of draft picks. A lot of people. Yeah, and a lot of guys at a lot of different positions. I think a lot of guys that the Falcons are going to be counting on in the 2022 season. Uh, so let's just get started with the big man. Brrr. Drum roll, please. And I'm getting it. <laughs> Unlike last time when I was so surprised when Tori actually did it. <laughs> My oh, favorite goodness. part of the podcast. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, the big guy I'm yeah. referring to is Kyle Pitts. Yes. I, I don't know if you guys have heard of him. But no, never, actually. He's a pretty good never. Yeah. At, at, at this game of football. Yeah. Uh, we're actually recording this on Kyle Pitts Day, 8-8. Eight, yeah. eight. Very exciting. Um, so if you're on YouTube listening to this right now, um, just go back to our YouTube page, click on the drive with Kyle Pitts. Um, we take I him through uh, a round of golf with him and his dad. There's also a story that I wrote because I was fortunate enough to be part of uh, Kyle and Kelly Pitts entourage well, that day. I, I will say this. Scott says fortunate enough and he said, and I quote, I'm going to this. Right. The, right. Yeah, nobody really had an <laughs> opportunity to go to this. I just kind of like stuck a, a claim to it and it was freaking awesome oh, yeah. because everyone thinks Kyle is quiet because he's mild mannered in front of the camera not quiet he's hilarious hilarious yeah. yes he is super easy going and you can tell I like everybody uses the word swagger at okay I I, I have no swagger right right no I like, I think you I think you have a little a bit. little oh, bit yeah. oh, I would say so you got nice. some swagger. oh my gosh it's so sweet I, I'm, I'm really gonna have to figure out what that is and just try to mimic it uh but Kyle Pitts He's just he has, has this air of like this confidence about him this year. We he had over a thousand yards last year, almost beat Mike Ditka's record, second best rookie by a rookie tight end ever, Pro Bowler. That's like his floor now. Yeah. Right? And that that is quote scratching the surface of who he can be in the league per Arthur Smith. Right. Ashton, th- this is your first um training camp with the Falcons. Yes. Seeing Kyle Pitts work every day. What are your impressions? of seeing him go about his business over the course of these man he's he's been a big standout in training camp so far i think um uh, one of the biggest things that he wanted to focus on this year is his precision and route running and you can see that in training camp he's been getting open a lot i think he's been one of Mariota's biggest targets um he finds himself in the end zone a lot and i think you could see 
how you know that he put in the work in the off season because it's showing here in training camp. And you know, I, I think you know, like you said, Kyle Pitts is way more confident from last season, and you can see him going into a second year. You know, stepping into a leadership role amongst not only the tight end group but receiver group as a whole. So I think he's gonna have a, a great year, man. And and you know, he's off to a great start in training camp. When you think about elite tight ends, right? You think about Travis Kelsey. You think about George Kittle. I think about Darren Waller, mm -hmm. Mark Andrews, maybe. Is he in that class? Yes. Oh, yes. He, he's an elite talent. Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, I, there's no way that you can't put him in rank with all of those guys. Not a chance. Like this is a guy that what we were talking about had one of the best rookie years for a tight end ever. Period. Full stop. Ever. <laughs> he's only been in the league for one, one like, year. Like yeah. one. Year. This is yeah. I mean, I think it is one of those things that we are look like, I don't, you know, I know Arthur Smith very much like, don't put on the gold jacket before they've done anything. Like, and I ag agree. But with Kyle Pitts, like, the guy's a menace. Like, right. a nice menace to us, but like a menace on the field. And I don't know, they put, they posted, our social team put this video together of like his highlights from like year one, and it was like season two loading. And I, still, my favorite thing that he did last year was the stiff arm in Buffalo. Yeah, oh, man. That that was Ooh. nasty. That was nasty. <laughs> like, this guy is doing some really, really solid things for this team, and he is a foundational part of an organization that's going through a major transition. You know who else thinks um, Kyle Pitts is an, is an elite tight end is George Kittle. George yes. Kittle mm -hmm. loves Kyle Pitts, and George Kittle doesn't necessarily offer – he's, he's <laughs> an energetic sort. I covered the 49ers for a while, uh, but he is so complimentary. And I think that some of these other tight ends, they work together at these tight end camps in Nashville. They get a chance to see each other, and this guy is just – next level and it's crazy you go back be before the draft and everybody or not everybody but there was a big level of I don't know, consternation if that's mm -hmm. a thing right how can you take a tight end at four are you insane you're taking a tight end at four we need a quarterback we need a x a premium position quote unquote right i think they should be pretty happy with the guy that they got yes easy <laughs> that, it was happy. one of the best choices i think the falcons could have made easily yeah. um i mean the, the guy is is one of the greatest tight ends in the league right now. He's so young. He's only 21 years old. I know. Like right? it's it's, it's kind of scary to think about what he's going to do, you know, in, in this league. Yeah. Yeah, and and the more help there was times last year where I kind of thought it was Kyle Pitts and Cordero Patterson or Punt, yes. right? It, there just wasn't a lot of threats, so he was getting shadowed by Stefan Gilmore. That was he said that was his welcome to the NFL moment. Like mm -hmm. that dude is good, or he's getting double teamed, or he's getting schemed against, chipped at the line. I think the more options that you have, Drake London can establish himself. If, if the wide, if Brian Edwards can be a threat, then you can't do that to Kyle as much. And I think that, that will open things up for him. Um, so that was the easiest evaluation that we're going to make during right. this podcast, right? Kyle Pitts is awesome. We know who he is. Period. Yes. Full stop. Happy Kyle Pitts Day. Yeah. <laughs> Happy <laughs> Kyle Pitts Day. Um, Richie Grant is a guy who, when fans think of second higher level picks, they think immediate impact. And if you don't make an immediate impact, you're a failure and a bust. And what the heck were they thinking? Because there's another safety on another team that's doing better. And they got Richie Grant, who is um, – a core special teams player and a slot guy, kind of like a big slot. Um, but Arthur Smith, when he talks about long-term vision, it's always about Richie, right? Yeah, that's always the example he uses. Right. So where are we in this long-term vision? I think it's kind of like a transition period now where the expectations go higher. Yes. No, I completely agree. I mean, when you look out, it's almost, I feel very secure in saying that I think the safety quote-unquote rotation is set. I feel like from day one, we have known Who's going to be your starting safeties? You know it's Jalen Hawkins, and you know it's Richie Grant. And that has been how it's been for the last two weeks of camp. And I think that is very, very interesting. And I think Richie Grant, a lot of a lot of times with Richie Grant, I think what he did in his rookie year goes unnoticed because you talk to Dean Pease, you talk to Arthur Smith, they say, they say we threw a lot at Richie Grant. We put a lot on his shoulders. He was learning multiple positions in the right. secondary. And it it doesn't stunt your growth in a way, but I think that it is one of those things that we have to consider that. Now, in year two, they know what they have in Richie, and they are very much specializing him to be that counterpart, counterpart to Jalen Hawkins. And I know you wrote a story about their connection, Scott, but like, I think that is the most important because I said when Richie Grant was drafted – 
and that he was joining like Jalen Hawkins. And even though at the time you had Eric Harris and you had Deron, Deron Harmon. Harmon, and you knew those guys were going to play. But I said the future of this position is Jalen Hawkins and Richie Grant. We are actively seeing that come to fruition right now. Yeah, and Kyle, um, Kyle Pitts, uh, Kyle Pitts did talk about Richie Grant. He, like Richie's competitive uh, out there. He's super physical. competitive, and he seems very. He seems pretty comfortable, right? Like when you watch him out there. Yeah, I, he he got an interception today in practice, right? He did and ran it all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but he looks really comfortable. I think the communication amongst that safety group is you can see the chemistry building between yeah. him and Hawkins. Like those guys are very energetic. They're they're always on the ball. They're like, you know, Hawks or Hound, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? And I think um, you know, for Richard Grant going into his second year, like he 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 looks ready for this season. And I and I think that's the that's the biggest thing that I've been noticing right. in training camp. Yeah, and it's you know it's it's so tough, right? He, he he to your point, he he was learning how to play the slot and safety. There was a lot of things thrown at him, and I think a couple of times people kind of maybe misinterpreted what Dean Pease was saying about him learning the like system. Yes. Like maybe he's struggling learning the system yes. or his responsibilities. And I don't think that, that was comment, it. Yeah, that comment was completely taken out of context by a lot of people. Right. It was not and Dean And then they Pease. ran with it. Yeah, it wasn't Dean Pease saying that Richie Grant is super far behind and like doesn't know the playbook. No, it's because Dean was giving him a lot on his plate to learn. And this is a guy who came from UCF. Right. A lot more oh, simplified yeah. version of what he's being asked to do. Exactly. And playing the slot in DNP's defense is no Not joke. Not easy. Not easy. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think he's growing. It, if you can get a, a, a productive three-down safety, these two younger guys paired with some veterans at the cornerback spot, Hayward Terrell and uh, most likely Isaiah Oliver, mm-hmm. I think that's a I think that's a pretty good group, I, and I I'm excited to see how Richie does Me handling too. all these things. We're gonna start to get in, in, into the preseason and into the regular season. I also I, I hate when I lecture people, but it's like let's let's, let's exercise some patience here, right? Mm-hmm. Patience is not I, uh, it's patience. not a Falcons fans yeah. trademark, <laughs> but right? patience is a virtue. It is really. Uh, look, they're gonna give up a touchdown or two Correct. during the course of the season. It it happens. Nice. He's he's probably gonna get beat. He's probably gonna be out of position. At one point, but there's a long-term vision. This guy has, I think he has it, and I, I think that we're starting to see it. Somebody who didn't have the luxury of a long-term Whew. plan. Is thrown into the fire. Thrown into the fire is Jalen Mayfield, who mm-hmm. you, you go back last year, you spent most of his training camp playing right tackle mm-hmm. or competing at the right tackle spot. They have an injury issue at left guard, gets thrown in there. P.S., he was a college offensive tackle, not a guard. Yeah. So he, he gets legit thrown into the fire, has a rough first game, and then becomes pariah level criticized by the fan base as to what's wrong with this offensive line. And one thing that I... I, he stands in front of the podium so often. After that yeah. Eagles game, he stood there and took arrows mm-hmm. from reporters and dealt with it with class and maturity and perspective. Yeah. Right? I have a lot of respect for that. Yeah. I really do. Now, is he going to start our left guard? It's been Elijah Wilkinson's gig to this point. Um, so I don't know. But I still don't think it's like, okay, we're ready to give up on Jalen Mayfield right now. Right. And I, I do think that would be unfair to, to say that because even though right now we're seeing a lot of Elijah Wilkinson, but Arthur Smith has been very candid in the fact that Jalen Mayfield is working through a lower back in issue. Mm-hmm. We talked to Jalen today about kind of what that means for him. He was out at practice today. We're recording this on Monday. Mm-hmm. Um, you're probably listening to this on Tuesday. Correct. Um, so he was back out at practice, and Arthur Smith did say that they're kind of going to take it through the week before making a decision as to if they want to see him in Detroit on Friday. So this is all very kind of up in the air right now. But for Jalen Mayfield, he was talking like, I want to – like, if I'm at 100 and playing, I want to go out there and, and show people that I'm not who I was in year one. And I, I know, like, for the offensive line specifically, offensive line players specifically, when you talk about the jump that you make from one, from year one to year two, I think you see it most in offensive linemen. I'm not saying that Jalen Mayfield's going to go out there and just, like, play fantastic and it's just going to be night and day. But I am saying that I do believe that there is going to be a shift for him. Now, does – does that shift come in week one? Are we talking about him being a week one starter? I'm not sure because Elijah Wilkinson, every day since what, day one? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's been in that spot every he, day. Right. He yeah. has been at that quote-unquote starting left guard spot. So how much are we going to see Jalen Mayfield? Right. I don't know. I can't say yet. Yeah, and I think it's 
almost time to figure out who your starting five is going to be because those guys got to build chemistry together. Here's the sure. thing. I actually think that I'm willing to wait a little while longer. You are. Mm-hmm. If we want to go ahead and talk about the Drew Dahlman, uh, Matt Hennessy thing. <laughs> yeah, we might as well. Uh, uh, Drew Dahlman, another guy in this class that – they drafted last year are going to play an important role, but we don't know that for sure yet because every single day Drew Dahlman and Matt Hennessy are switching That's with right. the first like team, back to back. Back it's, to back, it's like you don't know who's going to start. Yeah, it's every it's every other day. And Arthur Smith was very candid, I think, when we talked to him on Saturday about that and wanting to see who commands this offense, everything like that. But the way he was talking made me feel like they're going to take this until they have to make a decision with Drew Dahlman and Matt Hennessy because I do think that they are very much right there in lockstep with each other. And so I think – I know you're talking about, like, building chemistry, and I know that's something that Arthur Smith talked about. Like, you want to set this, you know, in order for them to get that way. But I talked to Chris Lindstrom, and um, I think it was Jake Matthews, and I asked the question. I was like, is there a point in time – and I also asked Drew Dahlman and Matt Hennessy this. Is this – is there a point in time where you feel like this offensive line needs to be set? And they all said, not really. We're all working with each other. We're all in the, like, we're all in the clubhouse, clubhouse. Mm-hmm. This isn't baseball. <laughs> we're all in the meeting rooms together. Like we know what's up. We know what chemistry we have with one another. So <laughs> that to me says like, they're fine. If this coaching staff wants to push this center rotation to figure out the, a fair assessment on who they want starting week one, take it to the third game of the preseason. Oh. I'm okay with that. I'm okay if you if we see both of them a lot in the first and second game of the preseason. You know what? One of my favorite versions of Tori is passionate as heck about something, Tori, and that's yes. what we just got. <laughs> She's passionate you're about like, this starting yeah. right. position. And I just I, think it's so important. I think you're right. Yeah. And Arthur talked a lot about that position needing to be confident and decisive, yes. right? Making choices. Too often last year – not saying Matt Ryan was doing Matt Hennessy's job, but he was in charge of the, of the uh, some center responsibilities. That center needs to own that spot. They need to find a guy who can be decisive. I'm now joining your side Woo! now, yeah. right, that we can push it. And the only way that you're going to find out if you're decisive is if you go through some games with some yep. of these guys. Yep. And they're going to need that type of rotation. So – these preseason I, games are going, I are going to yeah. – yes. Yeah, yes. these preseason games are going to, to show who's – going to be in that center position for sure um like you said you know matt ryan had had to do a lot of what matt hennessy's job last year and um you know i, I think drew dahlman he's he's very confident if he does get this position he's i think he's going to do great even in his second year yeah it's it's definitely interesting about what they have going on up front and they have we talked about the cornerbacks having veterans and mm-hmm. casey hayward going to play every down. AJ yep. Terrell going to play every down. So that makes you wonder, like, where does Darren Hall fit into all this? He played mostly in the slot last year. I feel like we're seeing him. Sparingly. In, sparingly, yeah. okay. Um, we, we've seen him a lot on the outside during training camp. I, I think because he spoke on uh, Monday as well. Yes. He looks a little bigger. Um, he does. He's definitely physical, and he, he's a fun guy to watch out there. Yeah. Uh, whether he makes a mistake or he makes a play, he's going 100 miles per hour. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, he's ready. He's I think he's ready for this season. He talked about what he worked on a lot in this offseason, just getting faster, getting bigger. Um, and, you know, although we know Terrell and Hayward are going to primarily be in those positions for most of the time, I think when you put Darren Hall in there, he's going to, to shine and perform when his name is called. And, you know, that was the gist of what he talked about on Monday, you know, at the presser. Um, and you could just see that energy. He, although he's a young guy and he's playing alongside some veterans, um, you know, he's ready. He's ready to get on the field. And um, I think, you know, if if he plays a lot this season, he's going to do great. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting thing. And the farther that we get down the list, we're going to talk less probably will be about starters and yeah. it's okay if you draft a guy in the fourth round mm-hmm. and he ends up being solid injury protection for you that's what There's i was gonna nothing say wrong with yeah. That. yeah that's what i was gonna say is like darren hall's a good depth piece mm-hmm. and that's completely fine and completely normal i don't think like he has to be a starter, especially when you do have aj and kc who are your leaders of this defense in my opinion yeah mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, so I think that's fine. He does play with a lot of confidence. He's he's a, he's a louder dude. Mm-hmm. I'm a fan of his. He came from, he, he went to San Diego State. I'm from San yeah, Diego. There's a little bit of a bias there. I covered that team one time, a billion thousand years ago. Uh, but nonetheless, it, you know, I, I think that that's another kind of important piece. And talking about rotational guys, guys are going to fit in. Taquan Graham is another one of those yes. guys. They didn't do a lot of adding to the defensive line, and frankly, the guys they added are all gone. Yes, they all. Eddie Goldman. 
<laughs> retired. Vincent Taylor is now on injured reserve with he ruptured his Achilles tendon. Brutal for a guy yeah. who, yeah. who hurt his ankle in the season opener last year and then missed the next 16 yeah. games. Tough. You just feel for him. Uh, but Taquan Graham, a uh, fifth-round pick, he is, I don't know, I, I guess we could call him Grady Jarrett's protege. Cause well, that, originally that was Marlon. Right, right. So are you – are you changing that up now? I I, I just I talked to uh, to Quan during the off season. Yeah, and he just said that Grady Jarrett is the type of guy that he looks up to. Grady Jarrett was a fifth round pick. Uh, to Quan is a fifth round pick. Mm-hmm. Everybody said Grady was too short to play in this league. Everyone mm-hmm. thinks is to Quan big enough to play in this defensive scheme. Right. Um, and Grady Jarrett, who is a big fan as well. Uh, expects big things from this guy. Yeah. Now, does that mean like seven sacks or something? No, because that's not the position that he plays. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's a big, strong dude, and they're going to count on him, right? Yes. Okay, so here's the thing about Taquan Graham is somebody who I feel like we haven't talked about enough in training camp. He is rotating in with the starting defensive line. Arthur Smith has talked a lot over the last week, especially now that pads have gone on, about how he's pretty pleased with how the front seven is working. And Taquan Graham is right there in there. Today we saw, you know, they're working on run defense and all that kind of stuff today. But we saw Grady Jarrett, Anthony Rush, and Taquan Graham lining up with each other a lot. A lot. And I think that is very, very interesting in terms of kind of what you expect this defensive line to look like. And I think Taquan Graham's development is a reason why this coaching staff is okay with what's transpired with some of the other defensive linemen that they've brought in. I think they feel really good about where Taquan Graham is right now. I asked Arthur Smith about that. And, you know, I was like, I feel like he's somebody, you talk about that jump, feel like he's somebody who's making that jump. And he was like, yeah, we feel good about where he's at in terms of what we need from him. Has he, has he been rotating with Marlon Davidson? Uh, well, camp? Yeah, a bit. I think it's been kind of like the, – the thing is, is like I tell people this all the time. Like when it comes to fronts, like D, Dean P's like runs so – it's just mul- it's just a multiple front. Like right. so sometimes you're going to see different guys. That's why I say like quote-unquote starters doesn't really matter to me at like on that front seven just because he yeah. there, he has so many packages. Because Grady's going to play every down. And yep. when Anthony Rush, who's – um, every bit of 340 um, <laughs> large human is being. in the middle then you've yeah you, you've got Davidson and Graham kind of working there mm-hmm. it does seem like Graham has a little bit of an edge there I think I, it's I, fair to say I think so I think he, I've seen him more recently than I've seen Marlon yeah. right um, and I, I think that that's going to be a good thing you know what I'm noticing as we're going through this it's kind of like a lot of positivity here mm-hmm. when it, it comes to this draft class. You I feel mean, good about them. Yeah, I think you do. And I'm sure people listening will drop some YouTube comments saying that, like, Jalen Mayfield is the worst player that we've ever seen mm-hmm. in the history of the offensive line play. Yeah, You're going to get a little pushback from us. And I think that's okay. But I think that as we look at this class, Tori, the only bigger roster construction nerd than me mm-hmm. is her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, and I think that these, in terms of building a roster yep. and a two slash three deep, that these guys are obviously going to play you, a factor. You have to talk about them. And I think I actually was talking to Jalen Mayfield today and I asked him the question about like, do you see this, like your draft class? Like, how do you see them? How do you see guys making a jump from year one to year two? And he he said something that I thought was very interesting. And he was like, look, we understand the position that our draft class is in. We were the first class of the Terry Fontenot, Arthur Smith regime. Mm -hmm. There's some, uh, some added pressure to that because this is the first one that they, this first class really, they stuck their name on. It's that these are the guys that we are going to use to build a foundation as we transition this thing. So for Jalen Mayfield to say like that, this draft class is very cognizant of that and their role in this transition, I think was very interesting in terms of like the big picture of why this draft class is so important to not just the 2022 team, but I'm talking 23 and 24 as well. Yeah. And how you build teams, I won't get too far down the rabbit hole, I swear, is nailing these middle round picks. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean like that's how you build roster depth. It doesn't mean Darren Hall needs to start this year or next year or any year, Mm -hmm. but is is there solid injury protection? Can you survive those types of things? I think these guys help those types of things. Um, Ade Ogundeji, we finally got to it. I was waiting for I've been seeing him a lot. Oh, my gosh. I was waiting for Ade. Okay, you talk about Darren Hall looking different. Ade Ogundeji walked up to me for an interview um, Friday afternoon. Dude has put on some muscle. He looks 
so different than he did a year ago. Because I remember last year thinking that Ade was like kind of a little skinny. Like and <laughs> I, I talked to him Monday. He said he lost weight during the season. Yeah. It kind of wore on him wow. physically. Yeah. yeah. And so now he walked up to me and I was like, all right, dude, like get after it. Like he looks the part more now than he ever has. And I think you, we're, when we're talking about this, uh, I wrote a whole story about it. So mm, shameless Great plug, story. Great story. Uh, go read my story on Ade and his overall development, what they believe him to be. But back in October of last year, I was talking to Ted Monachino, who is the uh, outside linebacker coach. And he made the comment then he was like, we expect Ade at some point to be the bell cow of this position group because we know this position group is going to have significant turnover. We're going to have a lot of guys coming in and out of this building. What have we seen in the last year? A lot of guys coming in and out of this building. The only person in this position group who has returned from last year with significant reps under his belt is Ade. He's going to be a quote unquote starter. I use quote unquote starter because again, rotations are important. Uh, but he is going to be a very important part of this defense. And I I would argue that, like, we are seeing him be the quote-unquote bell cow of, of the room, like what Ted was talking about uh, in October of last year. I, I think everybody is, is going to look at Lorenzo Carter and they're going to look at Arnold Ebicady because he's drafted so high yeah. mm-hmm. as, like, well, that's – that's Those our future, guys. and you, he almost gets kind of lost in the shuffle. He does, right? and he's such a quiet dude. So yes. humble. Yeah, yeah. Such, such a like quiet guy, and that was something else that I was talking to Ted about. He was like, you know, we want Ade to be a leader, but like that's not his thing. Mm-hmm. Like he's very quiet, and he just goes out and does what he's supposed to do. And he was like, all I got to do is put a green dot on him in the meeting room and say, all right, he did that, go do that. Mm-hmm. When he's talking about like AK and D'Angelo. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, he said something interesting though, over the course of the off season. He did a lot of film study of himself, obviously, but other. See, he talked about watching Max Crosby mm. and Sam Hubbard from the Bengals, mm. guys. He thinks are kind of long armed. They're similarly built and similarly. Uh, they have this like similar skill sets, and kind of watching how they went about their business. Obviously, Max Crosby has become a big time player right. and just kind of how he can use his, cause he's super long, yeah. right. Yeah. And he put on some muscle and how, how he can use his skills to improve. So, um, I think that's interesting. Um, this, another one of those guys that is going to kind of fit in to this group is going to, uh, high expectations. Avery Williams, we all know, right. He mm-hmm. s- switched from slot cornerback and really defensive back over to the offensive side. Yeah. He's played running back in high school. Mm-hmm. I think it's, it's it's an interesting move. What, whether the exp- you wrote about the story, yes, so I, I won't talk too much about it. But uh, he's he's a return man first, yes, and anywhere else second. Yeah, but uh, they're working to try to see where he can fit mm-hmm. in. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, and I think that's something that I tried to get across when I did write about Avery Williams. I'm like, yeah, like this is fun and flashy that he's making this transition to running back, but do not forget that Avery Williams is at his best when a punt lands in his hands. Mm, yeah, and I think. That is a little bit like everybody's talking about his move to running back. And I think I'm not putting words in his mouth to say that Avery would be like, yeah, the move to running back is just a plus. He knows why he was drafted. He knows his role is to be a special teams guy and to perform on special teams. He said his goal of 2022 was to be one of the best special teams players in the league. Like that's Mm. his goal. He didn't say he wanted to be a three down running back. He said he wanted to be a, a good, nay, great special teams player. Yeah. So don't forget that while he's doing all this, that that is his bread and butter. And I, I do think that there is value in kind of having him play running back because something that Dave Ragone has talked about a lot when they were talking about Cordero Patterson and his success in 2021 was about like ma- making like the running back, like making these plays kind of morph into like returns like right. it, it's from a vision standpoint like and i think that coincides with what we see from Avery Williams and making it to where it's like okay this is interesting it look kind of looks like what it would look like if i'm returning a punt like here's the holes here's how everything morphs out so that's my two cents you can also read that story on atlantafalcons.com um <laughs> <laughs> shameless plug number 2 You're right yeah I, but i he's you can't read too much into how somebody's being used in camp, but I think that we've seen him work in with upper level units. They're, yeah, that 
th- this was Arthur Smith's idea. This yes. wasn't Michael Petrie's idea. It wasn't Avery Williams' idea. It was Arthur's. And it was an idea that kind of was set from the get-go. Right. To be honest. Yes. That's something that is oft forgotten. Yes. Right? That, yes. That uh, Arthur Smith, after they drafted Avery Williams, said, you know, maybe we could see him on uh, offense. Yeah. That After he was drafted. And he looks comfortable. He, he He's does. been getting a lot of reps at the running back position. He's very shifty, can squeeze through holes really easily. He's a, a relatively smaller guy, so um, he looks comfortable. I think I've been seeing him a lot at the running back position during training camp. Yeah, and it, if if they can find ways to get him in space and mm-hmm. let him uh, weave through the Be de- his defense. slippery, shifty self. <laughs> right, then why not? Yeah, and and, and if and it, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. You got a core special teams player exactly. in the fifth round. Again, not a bad thing. So as we're rounding out this discussion, Frank Darby was the last pick of this uh, 2021 draft. The Arizona State product didn't play a whole lot Mm-mm. last year. Dealt with some injuries and things like that, and he's kind of on the fringes of being able to make the team again. I think that we need to see. A pretty good preseason from him yes. to really for him to force the issue because this receiver court is so much different than it was last year. You think uh, Drake London, Brian Edwards, Alameda, absolute mortal locks. Yep. Auden Tate. Auden Tate, I yeah. think, is probably in there, right? Mm-hmm. So now you're at four. Whether you keep five or six, yeah. you know, it, it starts becoming difficult because they have a there's a lot of guys: Geronimo Allison, Kaderil Hodge. Mm-hmm. Uh, Demier Bird. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of guys for those positions. Can he fit in there? I think that's a big question mark, and it's tough because he is he's personality plus. Oh, right? everybody! Yeah. I mean, everybody I, loves Frank. I yeah. feel like every comment I ever see on like Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or whatever about Frank Darby is like, "Gosh, we love him as a person. Like, we just want him to, like, you know, in order for him to be a fan favorite, he has to see the field. Yeah, you can't be a fan favorite and not make the team. So, right. true. Um, going off of all of this. Talking to Frank Darby today, um, it's funny. I feel like I talked to all of these guys within the last like four days. But um, talking to Frank today, you're talking about this preseason being really important for him. He knows that he does. He very much knows and understands. Like, and he even said he was like, you know, I am really sad, excited for the preseason to show what I can do at receiver. He was like, it's been so long since I've been on the field as a receiver. Right. And I think that's something that people like don't cognizantly think about when it's in, in, when you're thinking about Frank Darby, like he did play some special teams reps and you know, but he wants to be, he was drafted to be a receiver and he wants to be a receiver. And he even said, I was asking him about his relationship with Alameda Zacchaeus and how he sees maybe his role mimicking that of Alameda's because they, from a size standpoint, they're kind of similar. Mm -hmm. And he said, he was like, when I first got in here and I really started watching and met OZ, he was like, I told our receiver coach, like, I want to be OZ. I want to be versatile like OZ is. And so he wants to show in these preseason games that he can be like that that he can be a value in the way that OZ kind of is. Right. And I, I talked – I, I remember a story of an undrafted guy, Stanley Berryhill. I'm not going to get too far off the beaten path here. But he was – he also talked about being inspired by Alameda, who was an Crazy. undrafted guy mm-hmm. who made the roster out of an excellent training camp, cut his teeth on special teams, and found his way on offense over the course of three years. And now he's one of Arthur wow. Smith's favorite players. Mm-hmm. So those I, – I, I, I geek out over stories like that. Yeah. They're the you best. Know? Yeah. You know, a, a guy who was really good at Virginia and found his way. And that's what needs to happen with some of these, you know, guys on the bottom. And if you if you look at it, and even if you don't get maximum return, the best possible scenario for every one of these guys, there's still a great opportunity for this 2021 draft class to not only make an impact and get them through this transition, mm-hmm. but also remind them, hey, when you look at needs, you're good on cornerbacks because I'm Darren Hall and I'm and – I'm, a top tier number four, yeah. right? And I, I think that those things are important. You're obviously going to get your star power uh, out of Kyle Pitt. So yep. that's our 2021 draft class breakdown. Woo! Pressure's on, boys. It is. <laughs> Let's it is. go. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, obviously keep a close eye on on them during the course of this uh, preseason. We've got the Detroit Lions game coming up mm-hmm. on Friday. Friday night. Friday night. Came quick. Yeah, man, it's uh, the, all the days run together. So there's uh, plenty to keep an eye on during that preseason game. We've got you all set up, and we were going to keep bringing the analysis to you on the Falcons' final whistle podcast. Do your thing, right? Like, 
a five star review would be super mm. dope. Amazing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do that. And uh, you know, pump up our new guy Ashton, right? Yeah. 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 Let's, yeah. Let's, yeah. Let's, let's do it. Yeah, let's, let's <laughs> do it. And uh yeah, man, um stay tuned for next week. Probably next Tuesday you'll hear our voices again, breaking more, breaking down more Falcon stock. Can I just end this podcast? Why am I still talking? I don't know. <laughs> just <laughs> Scott, lo- Scott loves to talk. <laughs> that is a scientific fact. All right, I'm going to shut up right LOL. now. Bye, everybody. See ya. <laughs>